good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys? Thank you so much for coming out on this really frigid day. Um, my name is Nancy Chen. I'm the Senior Program Manager here at the Arts Initiative. Um, today, I'm really excited to host the second public event of the day in collaboration with Organize Your Own. Um, so for those of you who uh, may be newer to Asian Arts Initiative, we're a community-based art center that's been around for about 23 years. Uh, we've been in this neighborhood for about six years, and we host a neighborhood-focused uh, artist residency called Social Practice Lab, and we also have a neighborhood-based initiative called the Pearl Street Project. So you'll actually hear a little bit more about that from two of the artists in the panel today um, who were just recently artists in residence with us focused on Pearl Street. But I'm um, really excited to use the occasion of the Organize Your Own exhibition and the public programming uh, with the exhibition to bring together these four really great Asian American socially engaged artists and hear about, um, they're kind of at different points in their careers and have done a lot of different kinds of works with different communities, just to hear about their different approaches and the different communities that they have worked in, whether they felt they were um, an affinity with that, they felt an affinity with that community or decided to be outside of that community. So yeah, and this is Daniel Tucker, the organizer of Organize Your Own, and I want to say a little bit more about the exhibition as well as um, the panel. Great, yeah, thanks Nancy and to Asian Arts Initiative for um, having us. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, the, the exhibition that, that Nancy's talking about is one that I organized, um, and it's at the Kelly Writers House, which is on University of Pennsylvania's campus. It's up uh, until Wednesday, and so if you've got some time uh, to go check it out in the next few days, it'll be up. And um, just a little bit about the kind of backstory is that uh, the exhibit, it's, the full title is called Organize Your Own, The Politics and Poetics of Self-Determination Movements. And it sort of takes as its premise that 50 years ago, um, activists from the Black Power um, movement um, made a kind of historic call to white activists who had been uh, working in the civil rights uh, era and said that they should really focus their energy on organizing in white communities against racism, that that was the place where racism exists and that was where they should focus their, their energy. Now that happened 50 years ago. Obviously, there's been you know a kind of um, a massive amount of social transformation in that time period, and then there also is still a lot of work to be done. Um, and as exemplified by today's, uh, you know, kind of very strong movements uh, around racial justice, um, it seemed like a kind of moment to explore not only the the history of that. Um, that call, but also to think about how it does or does not kind of relate to the to the present uh, moment. And so, in order to do that, there's an exhibit and a series of performances, and it's happening in Philadelphia. And it's also happening in Chicago. There's more to say about all of that, but the the tie-in with um, with this panel today is that we have two two participants from the exhibit, um, Dan Wong and Rostin Wu, who are going to be on this uh, panel discussion. And one of the things that we were specifically interested in exploring as it related to some of the work that, that was also happening here at Asian Arts Initiative and with, um, with Emily and Alethea, who, who you'll also hear from on the panel, um, was the way that socially engaged art, um, broadly speaking, has a kind of um, a foundation in a lot of histories and ideas and language of community organizing. So the idea that you're sort of going into some community that you have access to, and that you're, um, you know, that you're organizing them towards some kind of you know common goal, um, and there's a lot of different versions of that and uh, ideas about what that looks like. But because that history is something that's referenced often in socially engaged art, a lot of questions come up for artists that are doing this kind of work of like, well, do you belong in this neighborhood or? Do you belong with these people, or is this? Are these people your people, or are they other people's people? And are you even supposed to be here? And lots of ethical questions arise around even, you know, who you're supposed to be working with and what the you know nature of that commitment is. And so we thought, um, you know, what better way uh, to have you know a kind of focused conversation around that than to bring some of the artists um, that were working in other contexts 
uh, as part of the Organize Your Own exhibit in conversation with some of the artists that have been um, doing this work um, in connection to Asian arts initiative. Yeah, so just the format of the way that the talk is going to work is there's four artists you're going to be hearing from. Each of them are going to have up to 10 minutes to discuss their work. So definitely save your questions for each of the artists and any projects they might mention to the end of the four presentations. And then at the end of the fourth presentation, we're going to come up here and hopefully have a conversation with all of you guys. So I think without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce the first uh, presenter, the first artist to come up. And that would be Emily Chow Block. Um, Emily is a socially engaged artist and community organizer currently based in New York City. She works with communities to build local campaigns for social justice that forefront the experiences, stories, and skill sets of her collaborators. Food is consistently an important part of her work. And I definitely see two, two guys, John and where'd Fred go? John and Fred were two collaborators in the very recent project that I believe Emily is going to discuss. So thank you guys for being here. Um, so come on up, Emily. to start off by talking um, a bit about my trajectory as an artist. As an emerging artist, my career has not been that long, so in, in that sense I can do a very quick condensed version of uh, the things that I've been interested in and where I've come from as an artist. So I went to college at Scripps College in Southern California. It's in kind of the outskirts of Los Angeles. And when I was there, I primarily worked with Asian Americans, um, my peers, Asian American women in particular, and Asian American queer folk. Um, these are some photos of uh, the, my friends and peers who I worked with at the Asian American Student Union, and me facilitating a workshop on Asian American identity. And that was really where I became interested in working in communities. Um, before that, I grew up in New Jersey and a predominantly white neighborhood, and going, getting involved at the Asian American Student Union really helped to open my eyes as to the power of youth-led uh, organizing campaigns that can happen and how important it is for people of color to talk about our histories as a way of building solidarity and shaping our futures. Um, let's see. So when I was um, working with uh, the Asian American Student Union and Asian, other Asian American organizations on campus, we, we did a lot of storytelling and story sharing, primarily um, but these that you're looking at are collective life collages that we created as a way of trying to figure out ways in which our individual stories intersect with a larger theme of an Asian American history overall. We definitely worked with the materials that we had. We didn't have really fancy art supplies, so it was all about using magazines and taking word clippings to piece together our lives. And um, a larger project that I did that uh, I ended up focusing my thesis on in college was uh, mapping out social autobiographies in a visual way and the kind of impact that that has on shaping political formation in communities. And so basically with, with my peers, um, we mapped out some of the prompts were our, our collective histories, or, I'm sorry, um, uh, map out two moments from your personal history and uh, two moments from uh, history that might be just important in general. And so a lot of folks brought up um, the LA riots, which were important to them as Asian Americans, uh, the Cultural Revolution in China, and uh, wars in East, in East Asia, and then personal stories of going to Scripps College and being the first person in their family to go to college. And along with working with Asian American communities, I did community organizing in Los Angeles, primarily with multiracial organizations, um, uh, created a lot of agitprop and whatnot. And so um, I felt like I, after I graduated, I needed to really tighten up my art aesthetic because I was really interested in what art could do for politics and how art could be used to build uh, social movements and voice for people of color and other marginalized communities. And 
I ended up um, in school at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And because of my political practice in California, I thought that it was very important for me to embed myself in a community organizing, a community organization as a starting point for working with communities. So I moved from working with Asian American um, in communities and people to working primarily with African American low <coughs> income and uh, often previously incarcerated populations. This is a piece called Community Corners that I created through surveying communities about the state of uh, the food environment in their neighborhood. Um, basically, it's kind of hard to see a lot of these images just because they're, they're projections from uh, the evening, but I, I talk to both corner store owners who are considered outsiders to the neighborhood um, coming in to make a profit off of the, the local neighborhood residents, as well as um, I, I spoke to neighborhood residents who um, felt like they needed more food and more help from the corner store owners. And there was an interesting dialogue that I was able to like weave together through that. Um, but most importantly, with the organization that I was with, we wanted to make, not just have this interesting artwork come from um, serving the community, but hold an event where we served healthy food um, made by neighborhood residents, and we also provided healthy food recipes um, as a way of engaging people in thinking critically about the things that they put into their mouths and how they cook it. And um, because it was a really large scale event, basically um, we had this big projection projected onto the facade of the corner store in the neighborhood. And it drew a lot of attention. Like it's this bright light shining in the middle of the night on a street that doesn't necessarily have a lot of activity in the evening. And so it got a lot of people's attention and we tried to use it as a platform for recruiting more people to work in the organization um, around food justice issues with us. And so, <laughs> This is skipping over a lot, but um, I then um, met an artist named Rick Lowe who is doing a residency here at Asian Arts Initiative, and he invited my colleague Alethea and myself to come work on it with him. And in we were primarily working with uh, overcomers of homelessness <coughs> and addiction and incarceration from the Sunday Breakfast Rescue Mission, which is a, um, a center right down the street from us. And through getting to know the, the, the men there and building relationships with them, we learned about, Alethea and I learned about this thing called Chi Chi that some of the previously incarcerated overcomers had um, made for themselves in prison. And essentially Chi Chi is ramen noodles, um, uh, cheese noodles, Swiss cheese or American cheese, um, some type of vegetable or two, and some type of meat. And when we at, when Alethea and I heard about this, we, we didn't know what it was. And so it kind of piqued our interest, and we asked, so what does that represent for you? Like, how did that factor into your prison experiences? And to be clear, not every one of the overcomers had been in prison, so it was just a section of the population. And everyone, well, most of them said it meant unity to them, or the anticipation for something better, or like a soul food that brought them back to their culture, um, because they're able to create it for themselves instead of be served substandard food from uh, the prison. So we work together on trying to create different recipes that are modifications of Chi Chi, so we could serve it as um, a vehicle for the guys to tell their stories to the surrounding populations who often didn't really interface with the homeless population and um, there's a, a picture of it before it's cooked and it ended up being a really interesting kind of exchange because actually these two guys this is Danny and this is Fred Fred is here today so um, he can also speak more about the experience and this is Anthony uh, Danny and Fred had never been incarcerated but Anthony had and so this is kind of an interesting photo where he is introducing these other guys who he works with in the program to this food and everyone's like sharing their experiences over food and breaking bread. Um, and here, here's, I'm just gonna go through some more photos of when we actually launched um, the event and we ended up calling the, the work Kitchen of Corrections. Um, but basically, I also wanna touch upon how, as an artist, I, I've definitely shifted from working in my own community to working in a community that is not my own. Pretty much 
none of my identities overlap with that of the men. Like, I'm a woman, I'm Asian American, uh, I've never been incarcerated or never been homeless. Um, these are some comments from feedback we got from people who ate the chichi the day of. And so that, that becomes like a complex issue, right? Um, I, by jumping into a community that I didn't know, I had to learn a lot. I had to listen a lot. And there are definitely ethical questions around, you know, how you, it, it's not always the case that you have a person who's willing to listen to the community. Some people have their own agendas very outright. Um, but um, I think that there isn't necessarily time right now to speak about it, but as a mixed race person also, community and what is considered my own, I think, has been a really nebulous topic um, throughout my life and throughout my path as a, a socially engaged artist. Um, many people would think that I'm white, and so working in my own community as an Asian American, like maybe that's an Asian American community, maybe that's a white community, but in every community, I'm pretty much also marked as an outsider. Like a lot of people don't see me as a part of the community. So that becomes like a really interesting tension and I think that for myself, um, it's been an amazing learning experience um, to work outside, really outside of my community, not within Asian American, not within white communities. And um, it definitely aligns with my political upbringing. Like I was essentially raised in multiracial organi organizing and um, with the understanding that not only should um, African Americans care about mass incarceration, primarily of uh, African Americans, but Latinos should also care about that, and um, Korean Americans should care about undocumented immigration issues that affect primarily Latinos, and um, African Americans should care about Korean reunification. It was this. It was this amazing experience when I was in LA. Um, of people coming together across difference to, to really try to work together towards each other's issues. And I think that that has really uh, shaped my understanding and the way I approach uh, organizing my own community, or not. Thank you. Thank you, um, Next up, we have Alethea Shen, um, a nice collaborator in the consumption residency. Uh, Alethea is a social practice artist currently based in Baltimore, Maryland, incorporating organizing and storytelling in her artistic praxis. Alethea collaborates with communities as an artistic asset to nurture and build solidarity and community voices. Alethea? I really appreciate Nina for inviting both of us um, to be part of the panel. Um, I think, um, in thinking about preparing for this talk, um, I wanted to reflect on um, the what 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 came to shape this topic, and I wanted to reflect on what it means to think about our, my own community. And so I looked up the definition um, and. From the definition, I kind of focus on belonging and like how do we um, start, like when do we feel belonged to call a community our own or how, how do we define where do we come from or what our communities are. Um, so I'm going to start from there. And so um, I've, grow, I've grown up half my life in the U.S. as an international student, half my life in, the U um, in Korea. Um, and when I started my MFA program in community arts in Baltimore was really the first time I really um, started to think about racial dynamics, political dynamics, especially um, starting the studies of what, it, what does it mean for artists to go into communities and work in communities that are often low income, often black, um, often just a uh, oppressed group. Um, I don't know if, if that's the best way to say it. Um, so in that, we were talking a lot of those contexts, and I realized it was shaped in a lot of a black and white context. And for me, coming as a foreigner, um, in some sense, I really, I found myself displacing myself from what people were saying, this is a problem, that's a problem. Um, so I was really trying hard how, how to make it relevant for me. Um, 
and oops. And how I um, how in that struggle I've started um, just exploring Baltimore, and what I realized was that in public markets and all these corner stores, I I met Asian um, people and. And talking to them, I realized many of them were Korean, um, and many of them Korean immigrants. And I was very shocked and, and very curious of how that happened. And, um, and so I just started talking to them and trying to um, talk to them to help me how to navigate myself in the community and what kind of role they were playing in their community, or if they were connected at all um, in the community. So a lot of it was a lot of just listening to their stories, how they got to the U.S. Um, and what their perspective is like of their customers. Um, there was a lot of stereotypical um, perspectives of fear, um, but there was also counter-narratives of friendships and, um, friendships and love and um, family. So the problem with working with business owners were they're very busy, and a lot of the my um, question was about how um, do you guys talk to each other? What do you um, how how I want to do a project with you and talking about your your dynamic and in the community, but there I needed time, I needed um, interest, and a lot of the business owners are way too busy. Um, with their livelihood, um, so it's really hard to kind of do any type of art project with them. And then I realized in the city there was a Korean senior center, um, and and they had lots of time and they were interested in doing art. Um, so coming from a ceramic background, I decided I kind of designed a curriculum of creating a ongi form. Ongi is a pot, traditional Korean pot that contains and stores kimchi, which is a very traditional pickled um, dish in Korea, um, and taking that form to become a narrative of the Korean immigrant story and also kind of be a metaphor of as the only pots are passed down to our contemporary generation to still continue to use, I wanted it to be a metaphor of their stories passing that on to us um, and what does that mean and, um, I, and I asked them to um, record audio stories of their stories and um, they're what they wanted to pass on to the future generation. And so, from my surprise, I think what I've learned from them was that that I was expecting this for lots of horror stories and lots of maybe racist comments. Um, but I was surprised a lot of them were sharing me about. I asked them, "What well, is?" Can you share one thing that you would like to say to future generation? And they all all of them talked about relationship and how is, how that's important, um, and how their lives have changed so much when they met that one person in the community um, to to open the doors for them to to the communities that were generally black um, to accept them as the business owners in the city. Um, so that was really powerful for me, and it really provided me a platform for me to think about um, as me, as going on with my journey, um, how do I navigate, um, and how, in what world, the, just reminding myself also um, to be mindful in the way I um, enter in communities and how, impor how important relationships are um, in, in just living in the world. Um, so, so then, um, thinking about ethics, um, I think it comes up a lot in Korean art, um, and I often question myself as a person, as who I am, um, again, as a foreigner, how do I enter into community in a way, and I'm also, it's an exchange where, um, and so I looked up the definition again, um, and I thought it was interesting how it talked about as a character, it's a belief that characterizes a community, um, is something that involves systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts of rights and wrong. Um, so how I interpreted this is that it takes, it, it ta it's not a one person defined. Um, how ethics become defined for a community or a nation or an ideology. It's 
a collective effort and a collective um, um, building of culture or histories. Um, so from from here, I also was really relating it to how it's a dialogue and it, and it takes multiple people interaction to build this concept. And for me, that that was where this is where I kind of relate to one of our experience in the consumption like residency at AAI, um, how we entered the community. Um, Chaplain Jeff, who is a chaplain at Sunday Breakfast Rescue Mission, he came in as part of our core committee and he really played a huge role in um, educating us as outsiders coming in about our how we should present ourselves to the men and um, also educating us of what's the best way um, and what has been done wrong and what, what has worked. Um, and one of his recommendations was just join what the men are doing the every day. And every day, those men at Sunday breakfast, they clean the streets, Pearl Street. Um, so from that recommendation, we um, clean with them every day. And it was a great way to get to know them, um, but the, also to hear about their stories of stereotypes that they have to, um, that they hear about how they're, they're seen as the people dirty in their streets, but they're the ones who, they also clean the ones the street every day, um, and in that way, it was kind of their own activism of also um, just in the journey of reclaiming, um, cleaning the streets as as um, just kind of taking ownership. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the best way to say it, but to um, yeah, just to um, do something, a gesture of. A gesture of doing um, something countering on um, what people's perspective are and how they occupy Pearl Street. Um, so Emily and I, we cleaned every day, and a lot, um, Greg often talked about how how was complaining about this, how people were seeing them. So from there, we decided to do this before and after photography series um, to leave. Uh, evidence of what we did every day together. <coughs> and yeah, and then we had an ex exhibition in multiple venues, um, one at here at AI, and the Sunday Breakfast Rescue Mission administrators came to see it. Um, it was shown at Chinese Christian Church, um, and it was the photos were used to fundraise um, money for the men's um, lounge or learning center. Um, and it will be shown at Cafe Lift again to um, again kind of tell the stories of the men's um, stories. And um, I wanted to talk about my upcoming project, but I'll speak that for time. Um, and this was kind of a resounding um, thing that I've thought a lot about in my residency, how um, our mentor Rick Lowe talked about how the center is in people and relationships. Um, <coughs> So yes, I just wanted to stress that. And just a quote from Jack Chen from the Museum of Chinese America, just, um, what he talks about how understanding what's around you is to be part of it. And I think that kind of has been a sum of my experience here. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much for that, Amitya. Um, so our next presenter is Dan S. Wong. Dan is a writer, organizer, blogger, and print media artist living in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, Dan has uh, been published widely, and his art projects circulate um, in both activist settings as well as through artist-run networks. And along with seven others, he co-founded Mess Hall, which was a, an experimental cultural center in Chicago that ran for 10 years until 2013. And he regularly works in groups uh, that include Compass, Red 76, and Madison Mutual Drift. And um, in 2013, Dan was named a fellow in arts and culture leadership from the Rockwood Leadership Institute in Oakland, California. And now we're gonna hear from Dan. So I, 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 
I uh, contributed a project to the uh, Organize Your Own show that's up now. And I'm going to uh, break down a little bit uh, one element of that project. Um, so um, the project included uh, me uh, compiling a reading list of uh, an American counter, a reading list for American counterculture in a kind of expansive uh, sense of that, that, that idea of what American counterculture is. Um, and that, that list is a, a, a list of 313 titles. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the, where, I, where I got that number, 313. Uh, 313, um, the other way of saying it, right? Uh, and it comes from um, the area code for Detroit. And I wanted to show a bit of, of, of break down a little bit of that history, right? Um, like this says something. The bottom button. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for, 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 for people, to, here's a little tiny little history about area codes, right? Back in uh, 1947, as you see, Here's the original area code uh, map that was uh, uh, devised by the FCC or whatever the precursor to the FCC was at that time. And uh, you can see, oops, uh, okay, yeah, right, 313, right? And so, so you know, the, these, these original area codes, of course, have been inherited, uh, and they mostly still apply to, um, you know, smaller, uh, geographical divisions of their original uh, place assignment. Uh, and my point here is that um, back when there were these rotary phones, the, the, the way that these area codes were assigned had to do with the speed of the dialing and the, uh, the places where most people dialed. So, two, one, two, New York, right? Two, one, three was Southern California, including LA. And three, one, two was Chicago area. After that, three, one, three. Okay, so it, it, this, this number itself bears evidence of the, the, the prominence that Detroit once, uh, you know, once, once had in, in kind of like the organization of the national infrastructure, right? And what I'm going to, I'm just going to bear with me. I won't take too long. It's a very short presentation. I only have like 14 slides. So this is all to say that something as uh, seemingly natural now, or or sort of divorced from place and territory as uh, area codes have a specific history that have to do with, um, you know, the analog world that uh, was like, you know, was that, that preceded the world we live in now. And uh, as far as Detroit goes, this was the place that uh, Mario Tronti, an Italian uh, labor and uh, uh, kind of post-Marxist theorist, he said once that if you want to understand Marx, look at Detroit. Marx in Detroit, that became his phrase. That's the science and signage I caught in Detroit, actually. And his point was that you want to see the story of capital and the way that industry rises at, in relation to labor, uh, look at Detroit, look at where the whole, that whole narrative, that's, that's the clearest example of everything that Marx was talking about. Now Detroit, of course, had this uh, you know, endemic counterculture, what I could call counterculture, uh, to come out of it. That's John Sinclair, uh, uh, he, was a, uh, you know, he was a manager, impresario of the uh, rock group, the MC5. This uh, is a, a, a canvas uh, painted by the uh, art, uh, music uh, group collective uh, destroy all monsters uh, with you know, Iggy Pop, these little on these sidebars of these, these, these figures that were Detroit figures, right? Uh, 
uh, Funkadelic, George Clinton, and then they, they lived in Detroit uh, before they became came to prominence and one of the bigger things. Ted Nugent, who of course is a you know, right-wing whack job now, um, but he was part of that whole countercultural scene. And a, a, a European avant-garde kind of entered into North America and into the English-speaking world through Detroit. This book, many of you know of it, and I've read it, struggled with it, love it, whatever. Um, uh, that was first translated into English and printed, published, distributed by people in Detroit, not the coasts. Uh, of course, Detroit is uh, what Grace Lee Boggs calls the movement city, and there are many uh, different um, episodes of uh, um, you know tension boiling over into serious flashpoints. Is a picture from the 1967 riots, which a lot of people in Detroit still refer to as the rebellion. Uh, place of contradictions, right? UA, oops. UAW. It's a labor town, Japan bashing, you know, doing a, doing a, a, a kill the Toyota kind of um, um, uh, demonstration. Okay, so this is all to say that those, you know, what I just showed you were like the, the sort of the conditions out of which a person like Grace Lee Boggs evolved politically, okay? And she did not think of herself or call herself in Asian American, she rarely called attention to her own um, identity, um, and it is interesting to me, like how kind of like retroactively, all of us, you know, including myself, assigned to her this identity and membership in something called you know, the Asian American people or community. Um, well, how did that come to be? How did that happen? Well, my argument is that the term Asian American came out of what was essentially a political moment, a moment where uh, a kind of political coherence emerged. Okay, this was in 1968, San Francisco State University, third world students strike, which became, you know, a, a, a something that uh, 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 became. Uh, Took, took, took form on many campuses all over the country. This is a picture from Sacramento, Sacramento uh, City uh, College. I think that's, that's what it was called. The reason I grabbed this is because of this. Ten demands, okay? This is what I'm calling the political coherence. Okay, it was that political co coherence, like having a set of concrete demands by which you could measure your, your political achievement, it was, it was, it was that coherence that required the construction of an identity that became known as Asian American. Okay, Duke University, same time period, demands. Uh, this is something that's not really talked about as much as it should be, which is that establishment of fully accredited Department of Black Studies. Almost all of the ethnic studies programs in the United States that exist now were concessions originally in response to militant student demands, okay? Uh, and that is the, the, that's the political coherence that existed at that time. Okay, so these were the student organizations that existed on the campus of San Francisco State University when the Black Students Union started organizing and making their demands. Okay, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, in between here and here, like, so this is like a beginning of 1968, and then by the summer of 1968, a new organization joined with the Black Students Union and the other ethnic specific organizations, you know, what they call the Third World Liberation Front, okay? And this was the first use, public use of that term. Asian American, okay? and in between here and here in those months, two things happened. The My Lai Massacre, which dominated the news and was a picture for all of the United States to see of you know, the kind of violence that was being visited on you know, what was in racial terms could be described as you know, a yellow third world people, and but Vietnamese, 
not Filipino, not Chinese. And then also another thing happened in, in the months there, which was the eviction of a bunch of elderly residents of the International Hotel in, where is it, Japantown or Filipino Town in San Francisco. And the residents were all Chinese and Filipino. So, there, you know, the, this came out of the need to develop a kind of political coherence that would, you know, bring into common interest all of, you know, what were formerly these nationally identified peoples. Okay, just to bring it up to date, this, this happened once again uh, in 1982, and this happened, you know, right in Detroit, uh, where this young man, Vincent Chin, was beat to death by you know, a couple of white uh, out of work uh, uh, auto workers who slurred him as a, a Japanese person who was stealing their jobs, right? And this again, uh, also in like as a response, created the necessity to build a kind of political coherence because it bound together in racial terms Chinese and Japanese, right? Uh, and, of course, speaking to the geopolitical situation as well. So, my last slide here. Just, just this. Uh, so, let, let you read it. So, my, 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 my point is that this, this term Asian American and identity Asian American is not an ahistorical thing, not a natural thing. It's something that is always under construction and in process and is a project of consciousness raising. Um, and that's kind of what I'm arguing for. Thanks, Dan. Um, our next and final speaker before we have a, have a panel and Q&A with, with all the presenters is Rostin Wu, who is an artist, designer, and educator living in LA. He produces civic scale artworks and works as a collaborator and consultant to a wide variety of grassroots and nonprofit organizations. His work has been exhibited in Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial and the Venice Architecture Biennial, and also at various piers, public housing developments, tugboats, shopping malls, and parks. And he's also the co-founder and former executive director of the Center for Urban Pedagogy, um, which is in New York and is dedicated to using art to art and design to foster civic participation. So here's Rostin Wynn. Thank you. Okay, um, I put in kind of an absurd number of slides. I'm going to go very quick. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of three different types of working that I do. And I guess just before that, maybe a little biographical note. So I am the child of a white woman and a third generation Chinese man who speaks Chinese at like a sixth grade level. Um, and so, and I <clears throat> took some language classes in college, but essentially I've kind of always had an identity as sort of someone who didn't particularly fit in as a white person or as an Asian person and couldn't really ever claim you know, a, a really specific and hardcore like Chinese identity in any meaningful way. So I've been used to working always in a, in a role of being kind of not quite anything. Um, and so you'll sort of see that subject position, I think, reflected in different ways throughout um, these projects. But I mean, I should also say that for a lot of these things, I think I approach these projects without a clear problematic of whether I was organizing my own or organizing someone else's at that particular time. So here's the first set of projects. Um, so here's some projects I did uh, for people who are undocumented and uninsured. Um, I'm a graphic designer working with community-based organizations um, in a collaborative process to produce different kinds of materials. Not exactly agitprop, um, but pieces that hopefully change dynamics in different ways. So this is you know, a straightforward educational thing, like how do you sign up for um, different kinds of medical care, what are the problems with you know, Medi-Cal, um, things like that. Um, you know, even though I'm an Asian person, I'm in no no way in a similar position to someone who is undocumented and uninsured in California, even as a Chinese speaker. Um, this is a project I did with uh, the Black Workers Center. Um, it's about uh, you know discrimination against Black people in the construction business. Um, again, I'm obviously not a Black worker. This is a project about vendors uh, in New York City, um, produced with the Street Vendor Project and a designer named Candy Chen. 
Um, and this is sort of a tool for interactions between vendors and police uh, for them to be able to articulate um, their legal rights as, as vendors. Um, and then lastly, here's a project um, that's designed as the audience of it is uh, employers of people. It's produced in collaboration with the designer Sarah McKay and the Fortune Society. And it's about um, helping employers understand that their uh, legal, legal, I don't know, the law uh, regarding uh, employment discrimination um, against people who have criminal records. So that's one example of a kind of project where I'm just entering in with a particular skill set, working with another community that is already organized and structured to some extent, and producing projects. And I find that relationship really satisfying. Um, Here's another kind of project um, where I think that uh, there's a sort of a reversal that happens. I was asked by the Los Angeles County Arts Commission to produce a work, uh, like a community design project, um, where people would do a community vision process in Willowbrook, which is in South LA between Watts and Compton. These are the sort of images that I think people around the world have when they think of Watts and Compton, um, including many people who work for Los Angeles County. Um, metro. <laughs> um, people who even work in the neighborhood, I think this is sort of the optic by which they see the neighborhood. And in doing the project, it sort of became a project of refusal, where it was like, actually, these people don't really want to do another community design process and create a vision. This is a, a, a plan from the 70s, and Watts' first uh, line is, let's be honest, the last thing the residents of Watts want to see or read about is another plan for this nationally known community. Plans and studies have a way of wearing thin over the years. So this is done in the 70s, and so like I was asked to kind of do the same thing, in 2014, and I was like, that's terrible, I, I don't want to do that. Um, so they'd just actually done a whole community planning process that led nowhere. And so it ended up being as kind of a project that refused the, the request and instead was a tool sort of to organize and educate the people who were working at um, the Arts Commission, working at the County Planning Department, working at Metro, um, and they became sort of the target of that project rather than the residents of Willowbrook. So it's like, here's something to help you kind of think about this place in a different way. Um, and so that's a, another form of like a project that it, 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 I guess I think as a kind of an alternate mode of organization. So just trying to show a little bit about what I typically do. But I think the situation that um, I'm interested in talking about now that is the closest to like when I'm really organizing my own is something that I don't really do very often, which is you know when I make a work for a gallery space. Um, typically the things I do circulate in in places um, far outside of like an art context and I think to some extent when being asked to be in the show and produce a two-dimensional work for a space it's like oh I don't ever do that and it's a kind of like <laughs> a stumper um, and so it, it got me thinking you know uh, specifically about the idea of, of you know, who is who is my own and how does that you know in some ways my own are probably the people who are most likely to go to something like an exhibition space and so like I'm, I'm really um, in that in that way uh, often kind of avoidant of working with like my own community, um, if you define it in, in that, that sense. Um, so this is sort of a little side, side route that will connect back. Um, in another hat that I wear, I do a kind of interface design and data visualization, and for a while I was a consultant to this organization called ESRI, um, Environmental Systems Research Institute, and they are best known as the creators of the software called GIS. Um, and so that's software that's very powerful, a database connected to a map. Um, people use it throughout the world um, to make all kinds of decisions, whether it's like an activist agenda or, you know, more often like, where should I lay this oil pipeline? Where should I open a Starbucks? Where should I close a uh, Petco? Um, and so they use this, and they use specifically this tool in that context, a business context. It's called tapestry segmentation. And so this is a map. Can we focus this at all as, as tight as it gets? Um, Whoa. Okay. Um, well, actually, zoom back out. Zoom back out, please. Okay. Um, I can. I think I can do this. So the way tapestry segmentation works is uh, Esri has created a hundred categories of people. Um, you can see these down here. These are the life modes. Um, these are the the ten larger scale categories that go from high society down to American quilt, and then within um, they have kind of more specific kind of demographic census. So like. This is the social security set. These are the people who have this kind of age, this sort of race. Here's the things that they like to buy. Here's the, the kinds of things that they like to watch on TV. Here's the median income. And it, they create, you know, here's inner city tenants. Um, and this matrix is sort of something that's used in planning, like where should I site a Starbucks? Where should I, um, you know, where should I close this uh, subway stop? All those sorts of decisions uh, are really driven by these kinds of abstractions, um, an abstract model of like who these people are. 
And I, I quote that I sort of like to use in this situation, like, you might not care about demographics, but demographics cares about you. Um, that, you know, every day, all the time, whether we're being hailed by, um, you know, by the U.S. Census or being hailed by a marketer, um, you know, we're being kind of constructed as these sort of digital representations that then drive policy decisions. So I'm an advocate of this idea of statistical citizenship, that it actually matters more um, how you fill out the census than it matters how you vote in terms of what kinds of resources are going to come to your community, what kinds of resources will be taken away. And so working in this kind of project and being sort of like adjacent to all this kind of um, market segmentation, I became really interested in the way that these um, categories become, um, you know, there's this transformation for something that's very literal. People actually live somewhere. They have these kinds of preferences, maybe. But then they get kind of like put through a certain kind of grid and a filter and then abstracted into this database. And then that actually is returns back to that world where it's like, if there's not enough people who meet the criteria of laptops and lattes, you will actually sort of see um, businesses make decisions based on that demographic scaling. Um, and so like so sort of that abstraction returns in a bricks and mortar way back to your world. Um, so I became sort of interested in this kind of demographic hailing and like who is it that would actually be, um, you know, I think there's sort of a knee-jerk idea like, well, of course you'd sort of reject this um, sort of absurd uh, flattening of a human into these um, categories. And yet I think that there's not really a way out of that um, system presently. Whether or not you want to be involved in this kind of matrixing, it's happening all the time. Um, and so the thought of this like installation um, at uh, the Organized Your Own Exhibit is sort of to try to proactively enter into these kinds of categorical questions and get people to sort of think about how they themselves sort of see, see them fitting into a kind of matrix of identities that are generated by their answers to these various questions. So the piece asks people um, to put pins into these categories of how, you know, what, what of these terms best describes them. So you have these sort of like things that are very common and obviously there's really obvious critiques to be made of things like the census demographic categories of race, um, marital status or, you know, sexual orientation and so on. And yet these are still pursuant categories. Um, but then you kind of get deeper into it. So there's categories that come from um, community health surveys um, and mental health surveys. So it's things about like how long did you live in a neighborhood or, you know, what, um, you know, what do you think about your neighborhood and, and, the, and the social networks that are there, to even things that are sort of like your general attitudes, you know. Uh, I like to shower my loved ones with gifts. Um, I like to give the impression that my life is under control. Um, which of these things, and these are all questions that kind of come from, um, this is, these questions are from the uh, survey of the American consumer. And so the idea here is that, you know, both we can use this to um, collect actual information <laughs> Um, and get people a sense of like, here's who's actually coming to this, this exhibition. Who are the, who is the own of the Kelly Writers House? Um, but also kind of to like provoke, make a provocation, I guess, to like what are the other questions that we actually would prefer to be hailed by and um, be interpolated by if someone's gonna be asking us questions that then enter this matrix of this is my identity. Um, you know, what are, what are the things we would prefer? Because these are sort of the ones that I think are very commonly the ones that, that form the matrix of identity. In our, in our society. So even though there's an organization that you, know, you sort of typically think of with political, political organization around um, a specific like racial or economic identity, I think there's always this kind of like other identity that's being kind of put onto us that we probably aren't really thinking about that often that is the sort of like marketing, statistical, um, demographic identity that people are using um, all around us all the time. All right, so at this point, I'll ask the four speakers to come up front and sit with Nancy and I. Um, so I think just to, to start it off, um, those were all really rich and provocative, thank you. And, um, and so I was curious if, if any of you all have any direct response to things that, that you introduced before we kind of um, bring it to the audience. And where is the other microphone? Here, okay. Well, I, I guess it was, it was really great that um, 
Dan, that you, uh, I guess, laid out the historical context, because I guess I was talking a lot about like being in an Asian American community, and definitely that it never would have shaped and became the terminology um, uh, by which both Viet Vietnamese Americans, Laotian Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans, Japanese Americans could all come together um, without like San Francisco State University and the third world strike. So I guess I'm appreciating um, the context that you've provided for our conversation. I'd like maybe like to take that into question zone, um, which is like you know your last slide was really I think interesting and provocative about sort of the potential for a hollowing out of the Asian American identity and sort of the need for like a continual I don't know what it is like a supplementation or reinvention, but I I guess I'm asking you to maybe elaborate that like what are the things that you think would constitute the the action necessary to prevent the hollowing out? Is it this inevitable or what what would have to happen? To, to, to me, the, uh, the most important thing is to, um, to not divorce the term from its own history. Because once that happens, then you know, it, it becomes a static, uh, you know, a, it, be, it's, it becomes an identity rather than an identification. And that, that's, the, that's the thing that I, I'm always trying to push, is uh, the process, right? It, it is a process. Um, I like to think of uh, like a, the, um, the uh, British historian E.P. Thompson wrote a book called The Making of the English Working Class. And he emphasizes that we're making because these are, all of these kinds of identity, what we think of as identities, are made. Um, and they're constantly being made and reproduced. Uh, and I think that when that, that, that the making part of it is left behind or neglected and not actively uh, engaged, uh, practi practical projects having to do with like organizing around identities become really problematic and full of contradictions of like, well, who belongs and who doesn't? Who's allowed to you know, say this and who's allowed to say that? Who's allowed to wear this? Who's allowed to wear that? Um, it's interesting here, like uh, uh, on some level, all four of us are, are, are you know, like kind of living examples of you know, living in a zone where we problem problematize this, this question of belonging. And it's for exactly that reason that it is important that all of us you know, sit on a panel having to do with you know, Asian American uh, organizing or work, you know, cultural worlds of spheres of action. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so I guess before I hand it off to the crowd, I did want to, um, I did want to sort of like ask you all or invite you all to, um, to respond to any of that kind of problematizing that was offered, I think, kind of by um, you know by everyone um, in one way or another, um, in relationship to to the premise of the of the um, exhibit, which does look back to this call, which in a way was very sort of specific. It was grounded in a history of civil rights activism, where mainly um, that was that was specific, not that there weren't lots of different people involved, but there was a specific instance where there were kind of white student activists that had been traveling as as you know freedom riders in many cases to southern states to, to do organizing around civil rights issues. And that there was a sort of a shift, a political and ideological shift that happened um, where that where a black power movement emerged um, and kind of called for a different set of relationships between black and white activists in that context. So this is sort of a very specific thing, um, but I'm curious as you all, you know, all have sort of like thought about that, um, that history um, 
and you know have introduced your own kind of critiques as it as it relates to your own practices. If um, if there are instances in which um, you are really kind of compelled towards something that is sort of specifically, even in a kind of nuanced or critical way, you know, identifying who are your who are your people, and and sort of doing work that is sort of targeted at them, or are you, you know, I'm just sort of inviting you, or are you kind of at a, at a place where you think, that is, not, that is not possible, there is no my people, that is not the way I'm going to approach the world. Um, you all kind of hinted at this, I just sort of want to give you an invitation to sort of say, you know, more about it if, if you care to. I think, um, so as I talked in my presentation, I started my journey, I think anything, going into community, I think anybody who does that type of work, I think the first step is really kind of reflecting on who you are. And um, so, yes, know, your, know who you are and just reflecting on what are you bringing to the community, um, how you're taking part of community. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to uh, present, and it's like I had to really work through my, about me <laughs> and what and acknowledging where I am and then my and then that work translated into um, yeah translated into like what does what's what's in the community and so my direction of the work almost became about it's gonna be about empowering Korean communities and I'm gonna make them more present and it's gonna be about empowering Korean people, um, but then as I studied more into like the complexity of community and movement building and social change, I realized it's not just about Korean community. It's, I have to think broader and how how I can be part of the bigger picture and in understanding about different other people's struggles as well and um, what it means to be in solidarity. Um, so that was kind of my growth process in, in that journey. I was just going to say um, that I have seen Rostin's piece. I've seen the whole show, of course, at Kelly Writer's House. And I really liked your piece because it's so simple, but it also was just like, oh, it's so clear. These are the criteria that I can consider myself and like the different communities that I could or do see myself belonging to. So that doesn't have to be. Asian American or Chinese American only in my case, um, but it can be that I live in South Philly, I live in East Pass Young, I ride my bike to work, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so I think that, you know, we're approaching this panel from one lens, which is definitely the Asian American socially engaged artist lens, but I think I love your piece for just so simply making a map of, oh, where would I put these pins? Like where are kind of my values of who I feel most connected to? And that doesn't have to be a racial or ethnic definition. Um, I have sort of an answer to your more direct prompt. That, I mean, I think there is something that for me is relevant about the way that I think Asian people and maybe mixed race people and half Asian people in particular um, but maybe not actually in particular, but amongst many people um, who don't fit into the white black di like dialectic of American politics and American history, that there is a way that that does seem to play out in a, as a certain kind of advantage for me in, in doing projects where I feel like there's a certain set of questions that it sort of short circuits um, that I think is just an interesting thing to reflect on. That I think that you know I think oh, there's a very obvious question sometimes like well what does it mean for a white person to be doing this project in a black community? You know, and it's sort of, there's a heavy implication to like, what does that mean? Um, but I think that when it's like, what does it mean for an Asian guy to be doing this thing in this black, it's like, I don't know, like, <laughs> like that's just like a weird situation. Um, so I, th I think that, that there's, um, I don't know, that there's a certain set of like, kind of channels that like, it's hard, Asian Americans, like it's easy to kind of have them run out of it and fall into different places. And I think there have been times in my life when I was very proactively 
trying to find like, well, I should be doing more organizing specifically within an Asian American context and doing that work there. And I, you know, for many years volunteered with the Chinese Staff and Workers Association in New York City. And that was a situation where like, it was great, but like as someone who doesn't speak Chinese well and like has almost nothing in common in terms of like my experience with someone who's like a first generation immigrant garment worker, you know, I might as well be working in South LA with Latino black community. Like it's, it's as wide a gulf and there's as much stuff in common and, and not in common. So that's just something that for me and my experience, it, there's a way that, I don't know if I could necessarily characterize it as an asset, but it's a certain characteristic of, of my particular subject position and the way that I do these kinds of projects. Um, to piggyback off of that, um, I think the context that inspired Organize Your Own, um, basically like uh, the Black Panthers um, asking white folks to organize against uh, anti -racist, in an anti-racist way in, within their own communities. I think that like particular context is not entirely relevant in an Asian American context simply by numbers. Like white people are in abundance. White people are kind of everywhere. You could go anywhere, any city, anytime and find a large number of white people. Asian Americans, I mean, only make up 6% of the population just generally across the United States. Numerically, in rural areas, we're pretty hard to find. I mean, I, I do, that said, however, I do agree that if we're talking about organizing from an anti-racist perspective around specifically like black issues, then there is a need for Asian Americans to educate the Asian American population about anti-racist issues and where to place themselves within that context. That said, I think it's like a fairly different case than you know being a socially engaged artist and necessarily engaging in a project um, that it could grapple with anti-racist issues or not. But I mean, I mean, I think speaking to what Rossum was saying, like there, there is, I have felt that there was an advantage in being uh, mixed race or Asian American working in uh, non-white, non-Asian communities because I do approach it from a standpoint of I, I know what it's like to be different and to be excluded and I know that I have to listen first before uh, approaching a community with my own agenda. Like, I, I, I am able to place that there is a historical trauma of white people or outsiders coming into folks' neighborhoods and putting forth their own agenda, and I mean, that's not what I want to perpetuate. And I think having that context, being a person of color, though not black, um, I think can, can be an advantage in that context. Um. So at this point, I'd happily uh, invite any of you all to ask a question. We are going to use the microphone uh, because this is being videotaped. Um, and so please speak into the microphone. Do we have any questions here for the presenters? If not, I have a lot more. <laughs> so we can all stay here and listen to my questions. <laughs> Uh, Rust and I was really fascinated by the idea of this uh, anti-democratic demographic failing that affects people's lives significantly and it seems like a very specific space to organize and to ideally democratize and I wonder uh, if there are projects that you think of as doing that work that already exist or if there are ideas about how to do that work that you've thought of? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, and I'm blanking on this particular person's name, but I'm sure you can Google it. Um, but it, uh, there's a, a political theorist and writer who coined that term, statistical citizenship. And that was sort of around the time that there's a lot of politics around um, whether the census would do direct count or sampling and whether or not that would undercount or overcount various populations that are hard to get to by the census. Like the census tends to, if you use a sampling method, you're very likely to undercount the number of undocumented people. You're very likely to undercount, undercount people who don't speak English. So all these sort of marginalized communities get um, uh, sort of pushed out of the census for, for in that way. So he wrote a series of papers and you know, some of them were sort of like, here's, you know, A, here's how the census should be done. 
Um, and then B, if you are like a, uh, a like a white ally who's, who receives a um, a census form, here's how you should fill it out so it will like kind of like best like tip the odds towards counting the, the population most accurately. Um, so those are some of the things I you know that I can think of that I know of as as kind of um, you know specifically like demographic activism projects. I think in the like non governmental space, but in the sort of like civic space of just sort of like all of the ways that we're being turned into data all the time and where our, our world is kind of constructed by that and through corporate algorithms. I don't know of projects that are that are I think are really interesting in that field, but it really seems important that there should be, there should be some. <laughs> I want to I want to invite Dan to say a little bit more about um, the project that you developed for Organize Your Own. You you talk, you kind of gave the context and the backstory, but I just uh, would like people to know who either haven't seen the exhibit or maybe saw the poster but didn't know what it was sort of about in its expanded sense. If you could talk about that, the the, uh, the most important part of it in relation to this conversation is that it's a uh, um, it's a, it's a project that targets, uh, as, as, a, as a population for engagement, uh, students uh, who are, came to the United States to study uh, from China. So international students or student nationals from China. So this is a big emerging population, year-on-year uh, -year growth. Uh, it's uh, just starting to be recognized as a significant kind of uh, wave, um, not recognized really, and not discussed yet as a, um, you know, as a, as a potential and likely uh, source and point of entry for people who will be future Asian Americans. You know, I was. Um, uh, encouraged um, by some some of my friends who are who are students from China um, to pursue this kind of uh, engagement, um, and it's totally experimental. I mean, this is po this population is is very new and not studied, so there's there's it's just anecdotally described and known, right? Um, but uh, my, like one of my friends was a graduate student from China. He was, he was. I, I was asking him these questions, like, well, what, 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 you know, what's, what's the, uh, what's the motivation? Uh, why, why do people want to come here to study? Well, what kind of experience do they have? And, and I'm just trying to get a read on all this. And um, he said something very interesting to me. And I, you know, again, and and he, he himself, being a social science graduate student, knows this better than anybody in that it's this is not empirically based. Right. You just threw out these sort of guessing, you know, speculative numbers. He said, well, you know, I, I would guess maybe something like maybe like 50% or 50% to 75% of these students end up staying, like extending their visa or staying long term or maybe eventually will naturalize as, as citizens in the U.S. And then he said, for that other maybe the smaller portion, like 20, 30, 40 percent, who return to China, my, his, he said, my feeling is that they are going to be more nationalistic, more patriotic, more anti-American than the students who never left China. Okay? You know, when I heard that, I, I, you know, I, I, I was like, okay, so there's, that to me sort of spoke to the urgency of like, engaging, trying to engage in this way. right? Making something like what I did, you know, a, 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 a sort of a fantasy syllabus designed to introduce student nationals from China to American counterculture. So that's not happening. Um, uh, and sort of, I'm sorry, I'm just like I'm talking too much. But the, 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 to, to the earlier question about like organizing your own, for me it was, um, you know, when I was a graduate student in the, in the in the early mid 90s, 100%, um, 100% of my graduate student uh, art school output was all about like identity themes and 
Asian American motifs and Chinese American motifs and Chinese motifs and Asian motifs. It's trying to figure out like how to use those languages of like cultural theme, thematics and motifs, imagery, etc. Uh, I left all that behind after I left graduate school because I felt like at that time, in the, in the, around the time that AAI came into being, but other Asian American identified uh, organizations as well, cultural organizations. Um, I felt like they, they were, their missions were fairly narrow and not something that spoke to my larger political commitments. But like presence and celebration, like asserting presence and, 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 and doing it in a kind of a celebratory way. Right? And I, I was, my political commitments were more expensive than that. Um, but then in the uh, early 2000s and late, late 90s, early 2000s, I started to really pay attention to what was going on in China and a lot of reading, you know, talking to people, visiting, starting to visit, made a commitment to go there as often as I could. And I started to realize that the, that the changes in China were so momentous and the upheavals were so fundamental that there were many, many people in China who were also asking themselves, what does it mean to be Chinese? You know, from this entirely different starting point. Um, and that got me back into this whole, like, like from a totally different, you know, like direction. Like, okay, this I need to pay attention to this. I need to engage in this. I need to, um, you know, figure out how to ex have exchanges because the, them asking that question of like, well, who am I? Where do I belong? What's, you know, what's my identity? What's my relationship to my land? Um, a, a lot of them, they, you know, they didn't have that whole experience of like a couple generations worth of identity politics and you know, um, uh, consciousness. You know, they didn't have that language. So I was very curious to see like where that would go from you know, their their side. That went into this part. I, I can actually ask a follow-up question to I guess you, but then also all of everyone else. That I guess I'm curious because you sort of I, it was triggered when you said you um, you know at that point you made a commitment to go to China as as often as possible, and it, it seems like that's not an intuitive move to me. Like yeah, of course that's what I would do. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious, like, what it was that you decided, like, well, that's obviously where my your focus would be with, you know, working on issues in China, because I think that obviously you could claim a, like strictly Asian American identity, I think, in a way that maybe I have, you know, like, I don't feel any particular like national connection to China whatsoever. I felt no Im impulse, like, I need to be in projects in China. So I'm curious, at, like, what led to that, and I guess by extension, I'm curious about your project with um, those. Story, like how, how you chose that community, like, well, these are the people I want to be working with. Like, I think that's sort of an interesting question to me, is like, when you sort of make the leap of like, well, that's where, that's why I did that. I chose these people. Yeah, I'll, okay, so I'll answer that. I have questions for you guys, yeah. So the, 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 the uh, uh, I, I had a, uh, an earlier experience in China. I went to, I went to, I went to China in 1990, uh, well, the first time I went there was 1991. And uh, then, I, I, which was only two years after Tiananmen, and then I not many, many foreigners there, was still under deep chill. Um, then I, I went there for eight months in, uh, uh, starting in 93, I went there to study woodcut, and um, I had, my language skills were very poor, and, um, and so I spent a lot of time just, you know, observing uh, the, the, the social landscape. Uh, you know, like I could receive more than I could express at that point. Um, so I had a point of reference that was like pre-economic boom in China, and I, I was that. So my curiosity led me to, you know, want to go back to um, see what, what the, the you know, on the ground uh, kind of uh, uh, developments were. Also, when I came back in, you know, this sort of like my experience being in China for eight months, I kind of mute, not really uh, conversing with people, you know, sort of like in isolation, but observing. Um, and I came back and then devoured a whole lot of books about China, just trying to figure out what it was that I was seeing. And that gave me the sort of um, uh, jump to springboard. Um, but uh, I, I mean, this this question for for both both of both. Of, uh, okay, another thing in terms of <laughs> access and, and proximity to China is that like I I am the child of immigrant parents. Um, so some so my parents you know have have, have this direct had a direct link to Asia. Um, and, and in my growing up, you know, typical of people of my uh, class and you know, wave of immigration, I, I constantly had like new arrivals within the family coming. Um, 
so that like the fresh air, this whole sort of element within my own family. But that to me is is like the question for both of you, like as biracial and like you know how do you how, what when 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 do you choose to identify which way or is that a choice or did you did you come to see it as a choice? Um, that that would be one question. Don't need to get so personal. <laughs> I have a layer of questions. Um, my parents are in the crowd right now. <laughs> They're in the second row over there. Um, I guess, uh, like as as a mixed race person, I think it, uh, at least for me, I think it's had a lot to do with my upbringing. I was generally closer to my mom's side of the family. My mother is Chinese. She um, came here when she was eight years old from Hong Kong. Um, and also doesn't speak the language that well. Um, so I didn't have too much connection to like cultural heritage and linguistic heritage in that sense. And apparently my grandparents didn't emphasize a lot of the culture. I mean, my mom could probably speak to it at some other point if anyone wants to talk to her. Um, but, <laughs> but, but so, so yeah, I, was, I, was, I would see my mom's side of the family much more often. My dad's side is in Louisiana. I grew up in Jersey and my family's been kind of in the Atlantic, um, mid-Atlantic area, um, and all of my cousins are mixed race. Like all of my, my mom's side of the family, they married white people, and so all of my cousins, we all look very similar, and that was kind of normal to be mixed race and normal to identify as Chinese in that context. Um, so for me, that's, and, and then once I became politicized, it definitely was like a strong choice. Like, <coughs> okay, this is where I am, this is, how I feel, this is politically where I, I see myself. Um, yeah, and I guess I also want to kind of answer your question about like choosing the people you end up working with, because the, the program that I went to for graduate school at uh, the Maryland Institute College of Art for Community Arts, um, I think a lot of our advisors really pushed us to work with our own people. And in Baltimore, my people like didn't exist. I mean it's sixty some odd sixty seven percent black, like thirty three percent white. I mean you know, it was and maybe some other other, right? Like a small percentage of other. And in terms of a large Chinese population, they mostly lived in the county, they weren't there. In terms of a large mixed race population, uh, you know, like uh, I don't know, where are we? We're we're not like all people who are of Asian descent and white don't get together and have all their babies and then drop them off in one neighborhood where they just live forever. So you can't like go to one specific area. <laughs> well, maybe in California, I guess you know that's different, right? But but it actually, and and that relates to the fact that when I was in California, I did work with Asian Americans and a lot of them were mixed. But then since coming back to the East Coast, it's just so much more of a gray area like I my people like it, I I mean I can't find them in a lot of senses and I guess whenever I sort of meet people who really advocate for working within your own community I often will sarcastically propose like well what who do you think I should work with like who where are my people and people will often say oh well check the internet like there are lots of I'm sure you can find your people there like they're there they're somewhere don't give up hope but that's like not the point like right as, as a social engaged artist you don't want to be right uh, relegated to the cyber sphere unless I mean, you can but that's at any rate I think the beauty in working in social engaged art is working with people like interfacing building so maybe I digress a bit. Just to answer your, your question, I guess, directly, I, I think that I tend to identify as like an Asian person um, when I'm into like dominantly white scenarios um, and dominantly black scenarios. And yeah, and basically any situation where I'm not around Asian people, once I'm in a room full of Asian people, it's like, well, I'm, I'm not really Asian. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm missing like critical knowledge to like be like a true Asian person. You know, like, if there's, if there's, and I think that a lot of people who are like second, third generation immigrants feel that kind of like, well, you know, like I, you know, you, it is a definitely for me has always felt like a very active process of making of like, okay, I'm gonna like actively do some like 
Chinese stuff this weekend and like kind of like connect to like my roots. You know what I mean? Like you're sort of like, oh well, you know, I didn't really grow up doing like a big like like Lunar New Year celebration, but I guess you know I'm kind of into it, so I'll, I'll start doing some stuff like like that. But it is invented. It's definitely not like something where I feel like I'm having this authentic. Oh, I'm just like this vessel from which this tradition has like poured down into me. Um, so it is it is negotiated for sure in that way, and it always yeah. We have time for maybe one, maybe two, depending on how involved the questions are. And then shortly after the talk concludes, we're going to adjourn to the gallery for a reception. So if you guys can stay and hang out. And may, maybe uh, if there's, maybe we can take off the three questions and then you all can sort of give some final comments. Does that sound okay? Okay, so there was one there, one there, and one back there. Hi, uh, I was really interested in the, the project that you were involved in that you just explained to us, um, this cohort that you were following. Um, I, I, was, I was interested in how long you followed this cohort and if there was any conflict in their uh, understanding of uh, the American exceptionalism or the opportunities of the American dream as opposed to how they were raised about, uh, it talk about uh, the century of humiliation from the very little that I've read about uh, Chinese history. Um, and as you mentioned, you went back in 1991 when, as I understand, that was being pushed very hard about the century of humiliations that uh, uh, something like Tiananmen won't happen again. Uh, if that ever comes with, you, with the students who came over here. Um, I just have a very general question um, for all of you. Um, what are the challenges you face in um, creating community, community art? And what would you advise to people who are interested in becoming active in their communities or any other communities and using their skills to do that? Thanks. Uh, I have a question for Rostin. I was interested in that. Um, the Willowbrook project. I was I'm wondering about the reception for about your act of saying, "No, you've identified the wrong community. Let me identify the right community or a different community for me to make this project about." Do you all want to all maybe offer some final comments since some were targeted and some were general? To, to just, you, you got a specific question, you got a specific question, and then there was a general question for everyone, so anyone, so so you two can respond, or you can all respond, or how do you want to do it? Uh, my, uh, my response is pretty quick. Uh, the, the, the short answer is I don't have a lot of contact with undergraduates in general, um, not just undergraduates from China. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a, a, a you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of direct experience. I have more uh, experience kind of like talking, talking to people who, ha who do. Um, uh, and yes, my understanding is now, especially, uh, there is a you know, real push on the part of the central government to uh, build up a kind of a specific nationalistic uh, you know, historical narrative. Um, in 1991, it was, I mean, my memory is that, you know, you just, you just, you just didn't do that. It was, there wasn't a lot of conversation about politics unless in a very private uh, situation. Um, uh, you could, like, later on, you could talk about that informally. Um, I offer up my friend David Parker, who's sitting over there. And he, was, he also spent uh, some time in China in, I think, the late 80s, even. Uh, but also since then, so he would have a good perspective on that. On that. Um, as far as the uh, the question, the other question was uh, the. Well, the challenges are many. Uh, <laughs> starting with lowering your standard of living. Um, okay, that's number one. Uh, two is uh, to be prepared for the kinds of fraught, unresolved contradictions that come with this whole terrain of community anything, because there are so many built-in uh, uh, contradictions of like what constitutes a community, um, and what the mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion really are, 
and, to, and, to, and, and the best way to negotiate them, I feel like, in my experience, has been to be really honest about that and um, direct. Uh, that's what I can offer. But also, I'll say, in answer to, like, in, in kind of a general way, the question that you presented to me, I, mean, I would really be interested to, to hear Alethea talk about that in her own experience, because she actually she, she, she was an international student who has a good personal experience of living through this kind of narrative. Can you repeat your question again? <laughs> Did you feel like you were having to fight against or somehow process, uh, you know, maybe an identity or a narrative, maybe like a national narrative about Korean people, Korean, the Korean nation, um, you know, in a way that's like delivered through the Korean educational system, uh, and have to figure out like what that meant to you in relation to, you know facing yourself here, and coming to a kind of political awareness having to do with the situation here, et cetera. Thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think, um, I think choosing the business owners, I saw them as like a remnant of the history um, that was there, and I realized that they will probably be gone after 20 years, so the time is now for me. Um, and, and, yeah, and I think <coughs> the Korean diaspora, um, and it made me think Koreans are everywhere, or as Chinese are everywhere, or immigrants happening everywhere. Um, so I felt the need to address that um, as a participant of that. Um, Yeah, and then learning about seeing the phenomenon, like I see it as a phenomenon. I see is it uh, uh, is I see it as a result of like capitalism. A lot of the immigrants came because there wasn't jobs in Korea. I think the pheno phenomenon of like Western idealization as a student, like as I came to America for, um, I think yeah, even like working with Emily and talking about her history of, as a mixed person, like what does that mean? And um, our talks about white supremacy, and, like how does an Asian person grapple with that? Um, and for me in Korea, because we have a very close US relation, um, it's, it feeds into everything. Um, so I forget the question again, but I think I, think I wanted to, um, that I think in learning I think just finding the need to contextualize myself as um, I enter in the space has been very important. And, yeah. um, I think that the challenges I faced in doing community art has really been, um, I guess it's a matter of like placing, placing myself and learning a lot on the job. Um, no matter how much you study or how much you read about a community that you may in part belong to or you may not belong to at all, there are always things that you don't know. And so that, it, it's like a huge learning curve. Like you want to do something with a group of people but you don't know like where to start, and so you have to start really slowly. Um, with when we were working on this project here in Philadelphia, uh, we were coming in kind of on the tail end of Rick Lowe's residency that had already been going on for two years, and the funder was getting impatient. They're like, hello, here's the project. And so we had about five months to do it. But we, maybe the residency was old, but we were new. Like we, we hadn't lived in this neighborhood. We still didn't know the guys we were working with. And so we went very slowly and, and in a quick way, I guess. It, it took us like three months to kind of get to know the guys, which is like fairly quick but slow by the funder's standpoint. And, and um, 
I guess, I guess like having patience and, and understanding that if you want to do this kind of work, it could take you two years. It could take you way more than two years. But um, there are moments when you could bump, like bust something out really quickly. Moments, but you have to like be prepared to like spend a lot of time thinking that nothing is happening. Um, and then I guess advice. Um, I think that I found it really useful to start with an organization that already exists, so you don't have to do all that footwork of creating a whole new community and figuring out what that community is going to be created around and all the, you know, as you said, like the fraught politics and identities um, surrounding that. But also they can be like your guides. Um, we had, we were very fortunate to have Chaplain Jeff from Sunday Breakfast Back Rescue Mission who gave us tips and tricks and advice for how to navigate the neighborhood, how to navigate this population with whom we've never worked. And um, that was also the case when I was in Los Angeles and in Baltimore. Like having having that, that organization under your belt um, kind of gave you a bit of legitimacy. So instead of some rando walking into a neighborhood and trying to get some people organized around like an art project, like you you were coming from an organization that maybe people are familiar with and they, it, it automatically brings a bit more trust. Yeah, and it, it would help you too. Just, it just so happens that we just got hot off the press the catalog print for the uh, documentation of the consumption residency. So we actually have copies off to your right on the table in the theater. So definitely feel free to grab a copy if you'd like to read more and learn more about what happened during the two plus year residency with Rick Lowe and Emily and Alethea. Um, okay, I'm going to try to answer <laughs> that, the specific question sort of quickly. I presented the project kind of uh, in a recklessly quick uh, way already. Um, but essentially the people who commissioned it were really happy with the, the way that I kind of refused their question in a way that was a little bit surprising to me and it was a project that went maybe like a year uh, over schedule. Um, and um, yeah, it was a really long, long lengthy process of just sort of redefining even what I was doing there. And at the end, um, they became like really happy with it, like, oh, this is great, you know, it's such an interesting critique of what we wanted you to do. Um, and it became kind of like, a, it's a, and the history of the project has been kind of vexing in that sense. So, just to be more specific, we made a thousand of those books, half of them went to the Willowbrook Library System, where they sell them as a fundraiser, all the participants got copies of the books, and then the other half are distributed by the county to everyone who works in Willowbrook. Um, people who work for Metro, work for the County Planning Commission. Um, and then they've also had this life of like people sending them around as sort of like a thing for people to look at when they're doing a creative placemaking project because that project was funded through like an NEA grant. So it's had this sort of like kind of like weird life where um, and then the the county commissioner um, for Willowbrook uh, decided he wanted to commission five more projects like that in other neighborhoods throughout um, South Los Angeles. So in this weird way, like the project was sort of like look at all these things that are here in Willowbrook that you could be funding that are really great. Um, and instead it sort of had this weird life of being like, this is so great, we should fund more of these studies in like, a whole bunch of other neighborhoods and like do this like all over, like every city should have one of these, you know, like should have, have an artist who comes into a community and like documents it. Um, so it's kind of had this weird life of it's being, it's very well received, but it's also kind of like not been received in the way that I would, in the way that I intended it or wanted it to be received. Um, and you know, and I, I go and save this kind of thing, basically, at like creative placemaking conferences, and everyone's like, yeah, that's great. Um, so it has had this weird life where I think like it's it's had like this kind of endless popularity. It's, been, it's like a three-year-old project now, and I still get invited to talk about it. And I'm kind of like, it was, you know, it was great for what it was, but it's not the be-all, end-all by any means. Um, so that's a sort of a, a, a short, maybe overly glib uh, answer to your question, but that's, that's how it's been received, like very well, but, but oddly. Um, as far as like challenges and advice, I'd say you know the main thing I think of when I think of like like people who are doing kind of social practice work or um, social engaged art work, the advice I give is that it, I think it's really useful to learn skills. Um, I think sometimes like there's a sense that like oh well if I just go in and I have like this really great code of ethics, then I can like a project will emerge and people will want to work with me because I'm such an ethical person. Um, but I think that it's also really helpful as a calling card and a reason why anyone would even want to give you the time of day to be like, I actually have a specific skill and a thing that I can do 
and that's what I have to offer, and that's why you might want to work with me. Um, so, you know, if you're in, in school to like do this or you're just sort of trying to do this project, I think really figuring out like what am I good at and how can I offer that as a service to people and use that to be a transformative thing, that's sort of like the best thing you could work on is just like being like I'm amazing at whatever, knitting, mapping, what, you know, what have you. I think that's a really excellent note to end our conversation on. So thank you for our artists for coming today. So thank you everyone. Please grab a copy of the consumption catalog and also join us.